Hello and welcome to the second installment of Jackie Robinson and the Montreal Royals 1946 season in review. We're now entering the third week of training camp and Jackie has finally been deemed ready to play in a real exhibition game. He made his spring debut on March 17th. The news was relayed all over North America. New York Times reporter Roscoe McGowan wrote that Southern tradition and precedent will go by the board, and that never before in the state or any other Southern state has a Negro played with whites, nor in this city have Negroes been pitted against white teams. That was true, but McGowan and the Northern press, generally speaking, was being disingenuous. You could play integrated games in the North without much difficulty, but where it mattered most, in the majors, there were no African Americans despite the fact that the majority of teams were located in the North, and there were no black players in the minor leagues affiliated with the majors, whether the team was playing in the North, the South, the East, or the West, it really made no difference. But the tone in the Northern press was clearly condescending nonetheless. So on March 17th, it was standing room only in Daytona Beach's City Island Ballpark, which by the way still stands today and has been renamed Jackie Robinson Ballpark. 4,000 fans, including 1,000 African Americans, were in attendance, a real big crowd for an exhibition game in 1946. When Jackie got to the plate for the first time, he received a rousing ovation from the black patrons, but the reception from white fans was more tepid, but he was cheered by all fans in attendance his next two at-bats. He didn't have a great game though, going 0 for 3 with a steal and a run scored. There was a big crowd on hand, but there were two very important no-shows. Branch Rickey, whose fate forbade to attend games on Sunday, was not there since it was played on Sunday. And the new commissioner of baseball, A.B. Appy Chandler, was in Daytona Beach on that day, but decided to pass for unspecified reasons. So, the good news was that people showed up and there were no incidents during the game. When it came to race relations, Daytona Beach was known as a fairly liberal city by today's standard. One observer famously said that blacks lived a second-class existence there versus the third-class existence they lived elsewhere in the South. Basically, it meant that Daytona Beach was tolerant enough to allow integrated games, but not enough to allow Jackie and John Wright to room at the hotel where the royals were staying. They lived at the house of a prominent black resident of the city during camp. That relative tolerance came into light on March 22nd. The Royals were supposed to play in Jacksonville two days later, but Jacksonville's Recreation Commission voted to cancel the game, citing municipal bylaws forbidding interracial competitions on city grounds. And that was only the beginning of an absolutely crazy week in the Royals' camp. On March 26th, the team was supposed to play a game in Deland, Florida, a town about 23 miles west of Daytona Beach. However, that game was cancelled as well for reasons that were quite puzzling. A night game was scheduled for the 27th, but city officials said that the lighting system wasn't working well and that they had to dig in the field to fix wiring and that they had to do it on the 26th. So just like that, the Royals game was cancelled. That was the official version. La Presse newspaper wrote that the presence of black players on the Royals may well have been the real reason the lights in the land weren't working well. And Royals GM Mel Jones was even more assertive. He said, and I quote, we were playing a daytime game. It had nothing to do with the lights. So, two cancelled games in three days, and there was still the little matter of the second game scheduled to be played in Jacksonville on March 28th. The Recreation Commission hadn't said the word about that one. So the players got on the bus on the morning of the 28th, except for Jackie and John, who went by car. When they got there, there was a big crowd in front of the stadium. The city, after all, was 50% African American, and the local papers had predicted a huge turnout to see Jackie Robinson play. Unfortunately, the stadium gates were padlocked and city police was on hand to make sure no one tried to play integrated baseball. The presence of African Americans on the Montreal roster had led to three cancellations in less than a week. And that brought about a change of tone in the Royals and Dodgers organizations. Before camp began, Branch Rickey had said on many occasions that they were going to Florida to train, not to change local laws and customs, and therefore, if the club was forewarned that Robinson and Wright couldn't play in a particular town, they wouldn't, and that would be it. But after those cancellations, Royals president Hector Racine said it will be all or nothing with us. Robinson and Wright go with the team, or there's no game. And GM Mel Jones declared, we don't care if we fail to play another single exhibition game. 
So kudos to the team for backing up its players, but you can only imagine how Wright and Robinson felt through all this. Just think of the atmosphere around the team after the players made that three-hour bus ride for nothing. And on top of that, Jackie and John had to find a way to perform on the field. They did well enough to survive the first cuts, but the papers reported that if Jackie made the team, it would be at first or second base. Shortstop appeared reserved for a homegrown player named Stan Briard, very popular with the Montreal fan base. Camp had been very eventful up to that point and it wasn't over by a long shot. In the upcoming weeks, the Dodgers signed two more African Americans, while Jackie was tested by a major league veteran and pulled off the field by police. So be sure not to miss the next installment of the season in review, which will hit YouTube in early April. And if you subscribe either to the YouTube account or the Twitter feed of the Montreal Royals, you'll be sure not to miss it. So thanks for listening and see you next time.